Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. My name's Lucia France and this is a show where we give the answers to all of your property questions and problems. Now joining me in the studio today we have Stephen Galpin. Welcome to you Stephen. Uh, Stephen is a London property consultant. We also have John Howard. Hi. Welcome John. A property developer with over 35 years experience and Tony Gimple, welcome to you, Tony, uh, founding director of Less Tax for Landlords. So let's get on with the first question, which is for you, Stephen. Okay, my ex and I own a house in joint names, which has no mortgage on it. She is going to get a small mortgage to buy me out of the house and for it to be in her name. What will I need in terms of solicitors? Someone has said that I will just need to get a solicitor to witness me signing one of the transfer forms for the land registry. Is this true? How much should I be looking to pay? Any advice? Many thanks. Okay, well, what you do in terms of solicitors, of course, is entirely up to you, but I think the sensible thing here would be to appoint a solicitor in the same way as that you were selling your property. Right. Um, your, your wife is going to have to <coughs> have to uh, satisfy the lenders for her mortgage in terms of good title and everything else. So you're going to have to go through the process, really, of, of a sale. Right. Um, you are going to need solicitors. Um, depending on whether the property is leasehold or freehold will, to a some extent, govern the price. But I would have thought a, a, a transaction like that, you're probably looking at anywhere between 500 to £1,000. Pounds. Why would that differ as to whether it's leasehold or freehold? Well, leasehold is always more complicated because you've then got to go through the freeholder who has to give consent for the sale. Right. Yeah. Um, there are various, various other checks about rights of way, about um, rights throughout the building. So it's just generally a more complex uh, transaction. So where this person who's written in says um, they thought that they just <coughs> needed to get a solicitor to witness the signing of the transfer forms, what other things will the solicitor have to help them with there? Well, the solicitor who, who is dealing for the wife and probably the, the mortgage company as well is going to want information providing. That information will need to be provided through a solicitor mm -hmm. to have credibility. Yeah. Um, searches will have to be sought, consents will have to be given for those searches and that sort of thing. Right. So it, it's not just as easy as signing a document. I mean, I, I suppose you could do it at the end of the day if your wife presented you with all the papers, but right. I, I'm not sure how bright that would be. Yeah, probably best to seek some more advice. Any thoughts there, John? Well, I think independent advice is, is the key here mm. because you're, you, know, you are part in company. So actually, you know, you'll both have a set of lawyers really on it. I yeah. agree with Steve completely. Great stuff. Okay, fairly simple one there. So we shall move on to the next one for, for yourself, John. Okay, oh. I'm totally new to property investing. I was wondering if, any, wondering if any of you could share your recommended materials with me on this topic, perhaps materials that you use to get started. I want to learn all about the legal side to property investing as well as the best strategies to go about it all, etc. That's quite a big question. There, it is isn't a, it? A, a huge question. Where <laughs> yeah. do I start? We'll all come back tomorrow. <laughs> we'll all come back tomorrow, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Leave me here. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so these days with the internet, you can, you can get an awful lot of um, information. Um, so certainly um, I would start there. There are a number of people who have written some very good books, and I wouldn't like to mention who they are, but one of them is in this room. Um, and um, I would talk to the estate agents, get a rapport with the estate agents, Go and see them and, and talk to them and, and also speak to a financial advisor who, who will put, take you through the, the process and also a solicitor who will take you through that process free of charge for a first, a first meeting. Right, okay. And when yeah. you say sort of creating a, a rapport with the state agent, I have a friend who recently asked to um, put themselves on a list of estate agents for for properties that come up for development. It's very old fashioned these well, days. They were, they were asked to pay quite internet. a considerable sum of money. So were would you they? recommend doing that? I've or? never heard of that. Me neither. Um, That's quite unusual, isn't it's it? It's un very yeah. unusual. Really? I've, never heard, I've never heard of that. Mo okay. mo no, most agents, they're getting paid by the vendor, mm. not the purchaser. So I, I haven't heard of that one. I'm okay. very surprised. Really? They're friendly, they're, they're salespeople, they want to help, they want to sell your property. So go and see them. I think, I think the business ethos of an agent is the, is the key here. Look, whenever he makes a sale, he actually loses a customer. So they're very keen to have longevity with their relationships. Absolutely. So yeah. if they find a developer that's interested, that they know is a good buyer, they'll be very keen to develop that relationship. And look after them. And, and, and you should be equally keen to keep that relationship yeah. going. 
And, and just going back to this particular question as well here, John, um, they're new to property investing, like, and they sort of said, what, what would you most recommend, recommended materials to, to learn about the topic? Is it just sheer, just doing your research online? Just do the mm. research online. As I said, there's some good books online. Uh, and, but talk, you know, like I said, talk to the solicitor, solicitor talk to a uh, financial advisor, and talk to an agent. Yeah. Get your whole team around you first. And as one of the points to add to that, make sure the team talk to each other Very at the point. same time as they're talking to you, yep. otherwise you get disjointed advice. Yes. And they're saying investment. Is it investment or is it actually going to be for a, a professional property business? Right. You know, the way they should look at it is they have a sum of capital you know, to invest in a business. Mm. And whether that's property or equities or any other form, uh, that they need to work out what they want to achieve, why, what the worst case scenario is, even if they choose to ignore it. Mm. So look at the plan end to end. And if developing property, you know, building, build to rent, refurb, ground up, immaterial, treat it no different from any other business venture and understand why they're doing it in the first place. Yeah. And so, then get the right yeah, team. Yeah, I mean, that's good advice. I mean, I think, I think initially they're not sure what they want to do. So yeah. mm. by talking to an agent and the financial, you know, mm. side of things, yeah. they'll get an idea of what, what interests them. Because yeah. that's the most important thing, what they find interesting. So have a goal here and, you know, maybe a five-year plan or something yeah. like yeah. that to yeah. help them uh, get move along. Definitely. Great stuff. Thank you, guys. Okay, <laughs> Tony, on to your first question for today. Yeah. I have several soon to be vacant properties mm -hmm. and I'm looking to buy some more. Yep. I've been looking into working with the local councils to diversify my tenant profile, yep. but calculate that my profits would fall as a result. My question is whether I have the full picture. For example, are there any tax advantages for renting through councils? Well, don't let the tax towel wag the planning dog. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is the first thing. It's, it's not about tax. You know, business only exists to make a profit. Yeah. And if you run it like any other commercial trading enterprise, you can benefit from all the tax breaks that apply to proper businesses. Right. Renting to local authorities, you know, on the surface, you think, why would I want to do that? On the other hand, it's really becoming an excellent investment. Uh, the private rental sector is effectively now the largest social landlord in the country, more so, you know, since rights buy and councils selling off properties. Uh, uh, local authorities will pay signing on fees, you know, golden hellos. They'll find tenants, they'll guarantee the rents, they'll deal with voids. They effectively become your tenant. And yes, the, the numbers are less than if you're doing it completely off your own back. Well, then the costs of doing it are less than if you're completely doing it off your own back. Mm. But you have to make a decision as to whether or not you want to be in that space or completely you know, private. But it's a really good business model. And what would be the reasons why someone would want to um, get involved with this and work with the local council? All right, so on the one hand, you've got a degree of social conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on the other hand, it makes great sense because you can get multiple tenants who have all been vetted, voids are dealt with. Mm -hmm. You know, the rents are going to be paid. Are we sure they're all vetted? Really? Actually, sure the yeah, yeah. To yeah. so some of them are. Look, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm right of centre by, mm. by, by a long are chalk. You? Oh, absolutely, old chap. Um, <laughs> but, for the same, but for the same token, even the London boroughs, you know, who are predominantly left of centre, yeah. more and more of them are having to and Being want to work yeah, and get involved with it. Mm. Um, they, they don't know what they don't know as well. So by working together in partnership and telling them what you want and what they not, yeah. they will actually work with you to get the right tenants all round. The big advantage, instead of dealing with 40 tenants, you're effectively dealing with one agent, in this case, yes. the local authority And also the behalf. rent is guaranteed. If the rent is guaranteed... Indeed. Yeah, well, that must that's, be a that, big headache taken care of. It may not be as much, but if it's guaranteed, Indeed. it makes a huge difference. No voids no reletting fees, yep. so that's worth that's worth quite a lot. And I suppose that you have to make sure that you rent it out for a certain number of years, you know, so it's a kind of sound investment in that respect. Well, you should do that regardless whether you're doing it through mm. local yeah. authority or privately. Yeah. I mean, if you want short-term tenants, buy a hotel, do a B&B, Airbnb. Mm. If you want to be in a long-term sustainable business, yeah. the longer your tenants is, the better. Perfect. Well, sewn up very nicely. Well, um, that's all that we have time for for this half. We'll be back after the break.
Welcome back to Property Question Time. I'm Lucia France and I'm joined in the studio today by our panel of experts, including Stephen Galpin. Welcome back. John Howard and Tony Gimple. Uh, so let's start again with you, Stephen. To, this is directly to you, this question. Hi, Stephen. I want to know... Fan how... club. <laughs> I know. I'm <laughs> impressed. <laughs> Fan club, exactly. Hi, Stephen. I want to know how you started out in property. How old were you and how hard or difficult was it for you to get your first home? How long did it take you to save up? What is the process to get onto the property ladder? Phone numbers well or not? <laughs> right. <laughs> A life story, basically. <laughs> Can't afford a phone. <laughs> um, well, it was so long ago, I have to say, well, we have to go back in time. And when, when I bought my first property, I was 18. But I have to tell you, it was £2,000. When I sold it right. for £3,000, I thought I was a millionaire. <laughs> and uh, I never thought for one moment it had ever fetched £4,000, which it obviously did a bit right. later. But in those days, you could get either a 95 or 100% mortgage relatively easily. But of course, the, the lending process has changed. In those days, we were dealing with the building societies who were professional, focused lenders. They understood their business. You'd go and see the building society. The manager there would know the area. He'd, he'd know about you. He'd know about your employment prospects. Yeah. It was a very personalised thing. Yeah. And um, I, it's a great shame that in the 80s, all these building societies suddenly wanted to be banks and um, attract shareholders. And the whole market changed. Yeah. We then had banks coming in with Americanised point systems for lending. So the, the whole game has changed. And of course, since 2008, we've suffered from credit restrictions. Um, I've said many times that the Bank of England, yes, they've done a great job in strengthening the balance sheets of the banks in terms of property lending, but it's been at the expense of young people who want to have a home. They're being asked to put down 25, 30, 40 percent deposit, which at today's prices is incredibly difficult. Um, in the part of London I live, um, it's quite normal now to see a one-bedroom flat being sold for £850,000. Heaven knows what somebody has to put down on that and, yeah. and what they have to earn. So it's beyond the reach of young people and I'm very concerned that we're, we're not clever enough with our rental properties to be able to offer rentals in such a way that it substitutes for house ownership. It's a different game altogether. People are going to have problems when they come to pension age, maintaining rents and high rents and commercial rents. Yeah. And nobody's thinking about this. All we're doing is just kicking the can down the road. So I do sympathise with anybody who wants to get on the housing ladder at the moment. If you can do it, I would just simply say, do it. Yeah. Do whatever you can. If you have to buy jointly with your partner, then that's often a way of relieving the uh, strain. Mm -hmm. Parents are obviously helping these days a lot, but again, you've got to make sure that your borrowing is sustainable and that it's for the long term. I'd, I'd like to see some kind of durability test for young lenders to go on a small course with brokers, for instance, to make sure they understand what the real responsibilities are. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. But um, look, there, there we are. I'm afraid there's no instant answer. There's no easy answer to say, well, you need this or you need that. Every purchase is different. Every purchase has its own restrictions. Your employment has its own restrictions. And you've just got to think about it all. And um, as we've said many times on these programmes, Get professional advice. Yeah. Don't don't be frightened Definitely. to ask people. Ask your solicitor. Mm. Ask your bank. Ask your mortgage broker. Mm. Collate that information and make the right choices. And and you would say that it really is a lot harder for young people to to get on the ladder now because I think I think I can't remember where which show it was, but someone quoted a statistic that the price of a house in 1998 is now relatively sort of. 40% more than it would be, so it hasn't gone I think up. It was still hard. Oh. It, was, it, yeah, it, was, it was still hard. It was still hard yeah. then. It was hard. Still. But, uh, it was, was hard to get on the ladder, wasn't yeah, it? But it, it, perhaps not quite as hard. But it was hard. But yeah. the lending restrictions have really made it more, more and more difficult now, and especially in London, it's you know it's yeah. almost yeah. impossible yeah. for young people. But of course. Um, you know, um, got to I, live in London, I, I don't want to no. be, be accused of being London centric again. Oh, but, no, good, but, because but, that has happened in the past. It has. It has. Happened, it has. <laughs> but, um, you know, the problem isn't, in fact, any lesser. 
as we go up the country. The figures are different. Figures are different, yeah. But the percentages are still the same. But you can, but, but, you know, you can go and buy a flat for um, £90,000 somewhere, £80,000. Yes, you can, but your wages so, will be proportionally But, but if you're earning £20,000 yeah. a year, you could afford that. Yeah. Full-time yeah. income. Yeah, so, I see what you mean. It just depends yeah. where you are yeah. in the yeah. country. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you very much, Stephen. OK, on to your question, John. Hello, I would like some advice, if possible. I'm in the process of buying my first house, house to renovate and sell, right. or that was the plan. Yes. I've recently found out that I can't sell the house for six months unless it is to a cash buyer. Oh. My original plan was to renovate three to four houses each year. Is there a way to contact property developers who would be interested in buying a buy-to-let property once it's been renovated? Any advice? Greatly appreciated. OK, so what they're... Um, trying to say, I believe, is that if you buy a property through and get a mortgage on it, mm. the building societies want to see, see that you've owned it for six months in case it's a fraud case. Right. Okay. So that's why. So the way around that is to, um, if you're going to spend, if you're not going to spend any money on it, then it is difficult sometimes mm. to then sell it very, very quickly. But if you are spending some money on it, if you explain to them and show them the, the bills that you spent on it mm. to prove that you're not just, you know, it, it is a genuine transaction, yeah. then that shouldn't be a problem. Having said that, to, to buy something and sell it within six months, they're going some. I mm. mean, I manage it sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah. So they are, they are going some to do that anyway. So if it's only six months, I mean, they want to buy four a year and do four a year. Four years going some, I would probably say... To start with, um, they need to try and stick to two a year at the, mo at the most, not four, and, and build up to that. Right, OK. And the other thing is, you know, why are they looking to go to a building society, which is effectively something which is development finance? If you're buying a property, refurbing it, flipping it, mm. it's not a long-term personal loan. It's effectively yeah. a commercial no, loan. No, but I, th I think what they're saying is the, the purchaser, if he's going from building society mortgage on it, mm -hmm. they want to know, the building society wants to know that the person's owned it for at least six months. Prior. Oh, it's so a private. Well, he's, he's saying that he can't sell the house. It, it is to cut down on the fraud. That's really. what it means. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, what yeah, yeah, what yeah, the reason. Yeah. But, but, but Tony, mate, he makes a good point because actually, if you're it, um, in terms of buying them, certainly you don't want to be buying through the building. You're unlikely to be buying through the building site if you're trading anyway. Right. And there are a number of bridging companies and different things you can go, people you can go to for that. I think. Yeah. Sorry, I think the other <coughs> thing there is just to be careful is when you set yourself targets of doing three, four, five a year or something, just make sure you don't box yourself into a corner yeah, agree, where yeah. you have to sell. Right. You know, having to sell is the fastest way to lose money yeah. that you can imagine. Uh, and I think actually it's quality. You could do, you could do four deals and make 10,000 a deal, or you can do one, one deal and make you know, 60,000 out yeah. of one deal. So I think that's the other thing. It, 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 it's quality, not quantity. And just to clarify yeah. there, John, as well, you said that if you went to the bank or building society with yeah. your proof of um, renovation costs yes. and things like yes. that, they would actually they potentially will. let you sell it quicker. It happens to us now and again. Yeah, they will. Right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. OK, Tony, on to your next question. I now have six buy-to-lets under my belt and have given up the day job. Congratulations. Because of this, I'm now a ba basic rate taxpayer, but given the recent tax changes, I'm expecting that to change in 2019. I wanted to know if I'm better off keeping these under my own name or selling them to a limited company that I would have to create, all in an attempt to save on my tax bill. Also worth considering is that I plan to increase my portfolio over the coming years. They're looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope. Okay. Uh, tax is not the motivator. Is there a business here? And if it is a business, then you can get the, the tax benefits. Whatever you do, though, don't put it in a limited company. It will be the most expensive mistake you'll ever make. Why would you say that oh, to how, this particular person? How long have you got? <laughs> yeah, OK, for a start, you know, you've got to make sure you do get what's called Section 162 incorporation relief, i.e. the ability to transfer personally held properties into a limited company without having to crystallise capital gains tax yeah. or pay stamp duty. Stamp duty is a big one. Yeah. 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 Big now, yeah. now, advanced clearance is not available for that any, any longer, so it could be two years before you find out whether you, you've actually got it. Wow. You're then going to have to remortgage all of the properties because there's a change of legal title yeah. from you as what's called a natural person to a limited company, which is an artificial person. Right, okay. So you've got all of your time restricted panel of lenders, potentially higher interest rates, uh, debenture on the balance sheet, personal guarantees from all those involved, directors, shareholders, 
and so forth. Welcome to my world. Yep. And, then, <laughs> and then you've got the taxation problem. Yes, a limited company can deduct all of its finance costs, but you've got corporation tax, income tax, national insurance, employers and employees, auto enrolment. Uh, you've then got dividend tax. If you sell a property owned by the company and take the money out, potential director's loan account tax. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, to think yeah. About there. If you remortgage the property, um, sorry, if you if you if you've sold it, you know, you've then got personal capital gains tax. If you put the money, you know, if you borrow the money out of the company, there is loan account tax, and then the worst one of all, because it's an investment company, it's fully subject to inheritance tax. How much were you going to save by putting it in the company? <laughs> but, right, would you yeah. put, but, but would you put new? Would you set a company up for no, the new for the new no, properties going no, forward? You no, wouldn't. No, I wouldn't okay. do it. But I think Tony. Also, the other point <clears throat> here is probably just a very broad point at the beginning. You're going to have trouble financing this in a newly formed limited company, Correct. aren't you? Yeah, they're just not going to be keen to do it. They're, the first thing they're going to say is, well, yes, yeah, lovely going in. What's the exit strategy? <laughs> Absolutely, and, what is the exit strategy? Yeah. Yeah. And here, well, where they've said, am I better off keeping these under my own name? Yes, they are. They definitely are. But what they absolutely need to do is seek the right kind of advice from all of the connected parties mm -hmm. and then look at what their options are. Mm -hmm. But putting it in a limited company, well, you can do it. Absolutely you can do it. If you don't need the income, never will need the income, so you're never going to take the money out and you don't give us stuff about paying 40p in the pound inheritance tax. Right. Great stuff. Right, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you at home for watching. If you have any property questions you'd like to send in to us, then please do go to our website, property-tv.co.uk or email us, info at propertytelevision.tv. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.